this is the fun part of my job. Uh, I get to talk about something about which I'm deeply passionate, and that is how our connected devices are changing our lives, changing the way that we make decisions, changing the way that we um, develop loyalty, and ultimately changing the way that we experience the world, our consumer experience. But a lot of times you talk about UX, user experience, and people think about bits and bytes of your digital assets. A lot of times they'll think about what am I building, what's my website, what's my app, and all of that. And I want to offer today a broader definition of user experience. Broadly, what I want to talk about is how our devices allow us to experience the world and experience all of your brands. And so my goal is to talk about how we need to evolve our experiences that we offer to them because the mobile device is the aperture through which your customer is engaging your brand. So I want to start by just quickly talking about a little bit of insight as we jump in and then I'll make that as actionable as we can as we get in the back half. So to start, if you've been to Google offices, I can't see around the corner. So if you've been to Google offices, you've maybe seen something like this. Interactive show of hands. How many people have seen something like this before in a Google office? Cool. This is a represent, it's not like just a kind of a gimmicky thing for entertainment. It's a representation of real time zeitgeist, a representation of trending terms in Google and what people are looking for on their devices. Because, and this is by the way, I think we did it about two weeks ago, so it's not current because you'd have more about Glastonbury or more about something else. Um, but because we have this insight, because people turn to Google and Maps and YouTube and all of this when they want to take action on their devices, we have insight into what people want. We see it sometimes before it manifests and before we can react and before all of you necessarily have the insight to react. And so we build on this. And I wanted to start by sharing just one insight. I think a lot of people are aware that YouTube is a uh, foundation for a lot of cottage industry, that people are building cooking shows and unboxing things and teaching you how to use electronics. But I wanted to bring one specific insight here, which is around fitness. As people bring their phones and their connected devices into their lives, they're inviting in more fitness. And so what we're seeing is spin classes and guided meditation uh, and people doing CrossFit in the park with their mobile device. And so in that, there's an insight. It's not necessarily one that I know what to do with, but there's an insight about what consumers are looking for and how they're engaging with their devices. And the part that I have absolutely no explanation for is that it's happening at a massive peak on Tuesdays. And I think if you'd asked me what day of the week, I think Tuesday would have probably been the last day of the week I would have guessed that more and more people are, are trying to get fit using video on YouTube. But there's an insight there about how we're using our devices because we're connected everywhere that we are. So I want to offer you today two looks ahead at macro trends that are shaping the experiences that we're all going to have on our devices. And I want you to start this by thinking as a consumer rather than as the brand that you, that you represent. And so the two trends I'm going to talk about are first, machine learning, and second, voice as interaction. And so on machine learning, we're in an exploding data period. We have so many different devices that we use and we move back and forth between these devices and that's developing all of this data that is signal if we can only harness it. But so far a lot of that has been noise because we don't know exactly what the impact of all of that is on all of customers' journey and how they experience the world. It's hard to tell exactly how all that data comes together to drive an event. And that's why we're so excited about machine learning. And that's why we're investing in machine learning because it can take all of that signal and optimize and tell you how that works toward an event so you can tell the difference between all these gentlemen in Tokyo, mostly gentlemen, uh, in Tokyo and understand what each of them needs, understand which has visited your store, understand which has engaged with different things, understand all of these things and not necessarily need to be able to parse that data to make sense of it. I want to give you a quick example that is not commercial of this from Google Photos. And if you're familiar with Google Photos, you know it's a repository for all of your personal photos. And people manipulate and they do all the doctoring up and all of that. But they also make movies and they also make slideshows. And this is an example of where machine learning can help. Is it's a lot of work to go harness all of that data and build your own slideshow. And so if you're putting 50, 60 photos into a two minute slideshow, you could go through a lot of work or you could tag the face of a seven or eight year old, I don't know exactly how old he is and the oldest, and let the machine recognize faces back to infancy and allow this to construct a video. And this drives consumer delight. And it's something that used to be next to impossible or very hard and is now actually quite easy. And this is a Google product, but it's something that all of you need to be thinking about because consumers at the first moment delight in this and have this amazing experience, but then their expectations rise. Their expectations for how you can understand them how you can serve their needs, and how you can engage them go up. So that's machine learning. And put that away for just a sec. The second trend is voice. 
Voice recognition has gone up. The ability to process has improved dramatically. And the ability to process on the device so that it can be fast has changed dramatically as well, allowing us to have different kinds of experiences. So this is new research today that shows that as people can interact with their device in a more human way, talking to it, asking it for what it, they need, that that consumer then gets back something that's highly useful because we know what to do with that. The, the processing power for computers has been there for a while, but we haven't had the ability to talk to it and engage with it. And so as you start to be able to have this experience, people are searching and engaging and asking their devices for ever more. And that's not about Google so much as that's about our human experience. And so we put these together, the machine learning and the idea of voice, and at I.O., which is our developer event that we had about six weeks ago, we launched the latest in the evolution of our assistant, which is an offering that allows you to talk to it. Um, it allows you to ask it to take actions. Some of those actions fulfilled by us, and some of them over time fulfilled by you. And so in this case, you might ask it to get you tickets to see Spurs at Wembley, um, to reserve a car for you to get there, and maybe to get your kid or yourself a Harry Kane jersey. And all of those actions can get fulfilled. Deeply actionable through an assistant that you're acting with voice. But that's all I'll say about the assistant. That's an offering that we're bringing, and we'll invite many of you to participate in that journey with us. But as Clemency said, what I want to talk to you about is the idea of assistance, which is the idea that consumers expect faster, more personal, actionable, and seamless experiences across everything that they do. And that's something that every brain in this room needs to react to. I want to talk about how we bring that forward. So let's talk about some of the implications of this. The first is, as I said with Google Photos, every time a consumer interacts with Airbnb or Spotify um, or Trivago or whoever delivers a great experience, they have that great experience, but their expectation changes of all of us. And so I would argue and suggest to all of you that your competition is no longer whoever your traditional competition has been in your category. Your competition is now with the greatest user experience that consumer has ever had. And that raises the bar for all of us. And it makes it hard to keep up. And it's something that we all need to invest in, and that's why we're here today. I want to give you an example now of a brand, Assurance, American brand, I will admit I brought an American brand with me, um, but a brand that has tapped into this idea that you need to go out of category um, to build the experiences that your consumers want. Can we roll the video? It's happening. It's happening. In the modern oh. world, you can control just about anything with an app. Your son is turning on all the lights again. And with the eSurance mobile app, you can do the same thing with your car insurance. Like access your ID card, file a claim, or manage your policy. It's so easy, it's almost scary. Get out of here! That's auto and home insurance for the modern world. eSurance, an Allstate company. Click or call. I think the insight there is pretty big. Um, first, the insight, just a fun one, is that all of us, I have two daughters, give our phone to the kids so we can have a one-minute conversation with our spouse. Right? A little bit of nods on that. Um, the second insight is that it needs to be easy. It needs to be as easy as your one-click turn the lights on in your home automation system. And that applies to a relatively non-innovative category like insurance. I'm not sure insurance, I apologize to anyone in the room, in the insurance industry. But insurance is not known necessarily for its digital innovation. But in this case, understanding how to make that easy for the consumer is an insight that they can relate to in a, in a TV advertisement, but also how they design their products is they're borrowing from other categories as they do this. So I want now, I want everybody to think of a user experience that you've had on a connected device recently that delighted you, that served your needs, that you remember. And as I travel, I will tell you people, this is something that's so non-geographic specific. Everywhere you go, people love to talk about the experiences they have on their phones. And so just think for a minute about a brand that delighted you, not your own brand. You're not allowed to think about your own brand. We went and did this really quickly in the office uh, in London, and these are some of the brands. And so, just quickly, are, are some of the brands that you were thinking of here? Not one of you thought of any of these brands. So what I can ask is, can someone shout at me a brand that delighted you recently? Audience interaction. Not your own brand, but a brand that delighted you. Please, are you raising your hand? Babylon, online GP. Babylon, online GP, which I'm not familiar with, but I will go look at as soon as I'm off stage. Others? No one, this is a full room, no one's, please. Osper. 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 Uh, an app for giving money and paying your children. And it was easy, right? And it was something that you wanted to do, and once you had it, you don't know how you lived before you had it. And so the idea here that we're competing with that, because she can change funds with, with kids and send money back and forth, whether it's Venmo or the one that you named, all of these move our experience as an industry forward. And we need to learn from all of these. 
And so wearing that consumer hat will help you in your job as you try to get into this. I thought I would brainstorm a couple that delighted me based around the camera. So a company in China called Taobao that allows you to take a picture of an image, anything. You like someone's shoes in the room, whatever it is. You take a picture of an image and then can shop an online marketplace based on image recognition. Or Alternative, which recognized that because of the camera and the phone, they could disrupt the entire optometry process of eye exams, ultimately leading to you getting glasses. And so the simple insight leads to a business opportunity. Or a third one, personal favorite of mine, for anyone that has to bring things to the post office, SHIP allows you to take a picture of whatever it is that you want to ship, not boxed, and they will show up at your house in a van with a bunch of cardboard and take the thing away and send it for you. Simple insight that with a camera, you can understand size and shape and how to pack things. Or one that my daughters introduced me to, which is called Plane Finder, have people seen this? Where you can hold your phone up to a plane in the sky and it will tell you the airline, the country of origin, and where it's headed. I'm not sure how that becomes a company. <laughs> so some of these are insights that lead to business opportunities, and some of them are just insights about cool things that you can do with the technology. But this isn't about that. This is about applying it to your business. And so the key is thinking about what your customer wants from you and applying that. And there's a real cost if you don't. Because so many customers tell us that if you don't deliver on their expectations of their brand, that they'll hit the back button. So many customers that are younger are mobile first and engaging with your brand through a mobile phone. And if you don't deliver on their ever-rising expectations, they're going to disengage. And this has a taint on your brand, not just on that session or that purchase. And a lot of brands are struggling to keep up. A lot of brands are looking for advice. That's hopefully why some of you showed up today, and we're going to give you some actionable things that you can do with that. But our advice to people is not to focus on technology, not to think about AR or even the camera in the device, but rather to draw on a whiteboard the experience that you would like to have with your brand, the experience that you'd like to deliver, and then build toward that. And I want to give you an example now of a brand that has done this. Most of us will know the Hilton brand and some of their, uh, some of their properties, when the new CEO, CMO of Hilton, Geraldine Kalpin, joined about three years ago, Geraldine, I don't know if Hilton's in the room, congratulations and welcome, um, Geraldine decided to refocus the, the team on consumer experience. And what I want to show you now is a video of how they have rethought travel as a customer experience as imagined through the device. Can we roll the video? Mr. Hilton, you're said to be a man with the divine mission as an innkeeper. Is this true? Hilton's mission is delivering great experiences. We were the first hotel to put TVs in bedrooms, first to put air conditioning into rooms, first airport hotel. But having a history of being good at firsts doesn't keep you there. To be first choice for guests used to be about great amenities. And that's becoming history. Customers' expectations today are accelerating. Our customers are accustomed to controlling the life from the palm of their hand. If you think about Hilton, 4,000 hotels all over the world, nearly a hundred year history, but we don't have unlimited budgets, we don't have unlimited resources, so we have to continue to innovate to continue to be first choice. The risk is if we don't do that, we'll lose share to the others that have got there first. We have to constantly be obsessive about how we can use digital and technology to create a better experience for our guests, to remove the friction out of those travel moments but people were operating within specific departments. So we had a brand marketing team, digital marketing, e-commerce, and demand generation. So one of the first things I did when I started as CMO was bring the departments together, creating a single team, single focus across the customer journey. How do we deliver a better experience, take the friction out of travel, make our customers' lives easier? And a perfect example of that was our digital check-in. If our guests have become accustomed to controlling their life from the palm of their hand, why would we want them to go and stand in line to get a key so that they can go and stay in the room? Picture this, the day before you stay, you can check into the hotel. You can choose whereabouts you want to be. Then when you arrive, you know the room you're gonna be in because you picked it. The next logical consequence to that is digital key. Rather than wait in line, get a plastic key, you can click on your phone and it will unlock the door. Great hospitality and great experiences elevates the brand and it creates a loyalty and a stickiness with your customers. 
So when things change, when we move to voice control, and as you get to smaller and smaller screens and smaller and smaller attention spans, they will go out of their way to choose you in order to have that great experience. It's really important to be one that's constantly raising the bar, not bumping into it. When you innovate, you do it well, you move first and you do it at scale, that's the brand that customers love. There's a lot to, to call out in there. I want to name a couple of things that, that she spoke about. Um, she spoke about this idea, which you see here, of, of picking your room before you show up, which seems obvious and you should be able to do. They changed every lock on every door in every property at great expense in the physical hotels so that you could unlock the door of your Hilton room and skip reception on arrival. And for any of you that travel in the way that I do, um, that's highly impactful. There's two things, she was on stage with me about six weeks ago, uh, and she said two other things that she doesn't say in the video that I want to call out. The first one's a little funny, and the second one I think could be the subtitle for this, for this presentation. The funny one is that they had another insight, which we wanted to get into the video, which was that a lot of people want to order room service, but they don't know how long it's going to take. And they don't know if there's time to jump a shower, or to make a phone call, or to quickly do the things they need to do before the room service showed up. So they borrowed a feature from Uber, which is that it show you the time to your delivery, and then ultimately, they have a little image of a hamburger that comes down the, the hallway of your hotel and shows up at your door so you know exactly when your food's going to show up. Um, and the funny thing is when she shared that with the other audience that we did it in front of, like, that was the thing that got the big applause for some reason, was the burger coming down the hotel room. Um, I think the more powerful thing she said that will stay with me is she said a phrase which was, better experiences drive preference. In a category that although they have innovated, and she talked about innovation over the 100-year history of the company, in a category that is at risk of becoming commoditized, they are differentiating through the experience they give you on the digital device. And they're driving preference by doing that. And I think that's a very powerful concept. And she talked about the idea of making it fast and making it simple and making it deeply personal. And I think there's a lot to learn. At this point, I want to I pull back and broaden this and try to make this something that's actionable for all of us. And I want to talk about how, as consumer expectations of assistance grow, how all of us can build that for our brands. I want to do that through these three pillars. The first is it has to be fast. You have to help the consumer get what she wants to get done done and help her get on her way. Second, it has to be personal. And third, it has to contemplate the many different ways that she wants to engage with your brand so that she can get done done what she wants to and doesn't have to start over on another device and or have a seamless experience across those. So let's talk about each of these. The first is that consumers want you to help them faster. In an assistive world, you have to be able to answer them quickly. And I should say here that all three of these are foundational, regardless of where the world goes with machine learning, voice input, augmented reality, and all of these. All three of these will build the foundation for you. So I don't know about you, but I've become more impatient as a consumer. I think about a world of one-click ordering and same-day delivery and instant fulfillment, um, and my willingness to wait has dropped dramatically. As a result, it's not so much about who solves the problem or who has the best product. It becomes about who has the best product and can solve my problem now. And so I want to talk a bit about how you deliver on speed. The first thing I want to do is address the question that almost everyone asks me in every meeting I have with them, which is, how do I balance my site and my app? And what I want to say is I think we found an equilibrium on this, which is, and this is some new data as well, which is that your app is for your absolute best customers, your most loyal customers who know your brand and type in your URL. But the vast majority of your existing customers and your potential customers engage you on the web. So single digit percentage of your customers engaging through the app, but virtually all of the growth coming from the web environment. And so the web becomes all the more important. And we do a lot of research about what drives results on the web. And so I want to share two data points from that. But talk to your Google teams. We have endless research about how to uh, think about the, the uh, impact and sensitivities of mobile sites. So I want to call out each of these. Um, so for news and for publishers, the stat on the left is research that we did looking at a, a, a whole range of Google publishers. And the key point here is that the customer will stick with you for about three seconds. If they want to read that news story, if they want to read about the summer transfer window in football, if they want to read about any of that, if you don't get that page loaded, we all know the experience of waiting for a site to load. If you don't get that loaded, half your audience is gone after three seconds. 
The second stat is from the world of e-commerce. And this is an Akamai study that they did with a U.S. retailer called Fanatics. And they showed a curve that showed, how, as you make people wait, the fall off in conversion rate. And they showed that, and this can be a positive as well, but a one second delay or a one second improvement in page load time can mean a 20% change in conversion rate. 20%. And the curve isn't exactly linear, but the next second after that has a similar impact. And so now I want to share the somewhat shocking part is that we looked at a sample of 900,000 Google landing pages from customers across our biggest customers to our smallest, not weighted by revenue, just a sample. And the average page load time, 22 seconds. I don't know anyone in this room that would wait 22 seconds for most brands. Now, I don't want the people who have a page load time of like 18 seconds in this room to think you've got it made now because you're better than the average. <laughs> but think about how hard you work in merchandising. Think about how hard you work in brand building. For those of you that have physical stores, your real estate strategy is central in the C-suite. There's so many things that you do to drive performance. And I know from your experience talking to Google salespeople is that you work with us and, and crave a half percentage improvement in your ROI, as you should. I don't know any other places you can go that you can make double digit, much less 20 or 30% changes in your conversion rate on what is your largest and fastest growing platform that your customer engages you. And so to the extent that you're delegating your mobile site to the IT organization or someone junior in the marketing organization, please rethink that, because I know of no greater lever for driving results than improving your mobile site speed. So how do you do that? The first is that we built a tool. Whenever Google has a problem, we build a tool. So we built a tool to allow you to audit and test your site. So go to this test my site URL, not now, but go back with your teams and go to this, and the first thing it'll do is it'll give you just a straight audit of your site. How are you doing? And you want to hit that three to five, maybe six second window, almost regardless of what business you're in, and you want to get as low on that as you possibly can. In addition to testing the speed of your site, this will offer you suggestions for how to improve on that, a cataloging of things that you can do, and there's actually fairly low-hanging things. Two-thirds of page load time is driven by images. So do you need every image on your site? And second, do you compress the images? And I know I'm talking to like a room of senior executives about compressing images on your mobile website, but that's because it is that important that you can't delegate it. And so there's a list of suggestions of things that you can do there around caching and compressing images and limiting JavaScript, all of which can be done on your existing mobile website today. And I would say if you take nothing else away from this presentation, take away that you need to go do a full audit and review of your, of your mobile website and that you don't need to delegate that. For those of you that have the resources and the bandwidth and want to go further, there are bigger things that you can do in technologies that are available. I want to talk about two. Progressive web apps takes the best of the web and it's fast to load and adds many of the features that we've come to know from the world of apps. So it allows you to have offline experiences. Very important in areas where coverage isn't as big or where kilobits are very expensive. Allows you to have a, a thumbnail on the phone top for your brand. Allows you to do push messaging, all from a website, and most importantly, there's no action required from the user. There's no download, there's no install. It's the next time they go back to your site. On top of that, it's extremely fast. And there's an Alibaba example in the slide. I want to give a UK example of a real estate listings company, Settled, who migrated from their existing website to PWA, and saw a dramatic improvement in page load time and in conversion rate, just on the back of this investment. I think most people in this room would take a 23% conversion rate on their mobile customers. The second technology I want to talk about is advanced mobile pages. AMP is something that launched about 18 months ago, maybe a little bit more, and it's about rapid page load time. And this is targeted at publishers, big, heavy, news-oriented pages with video or audio, allows you to load very, very quickly. Sub one second page load time. We are proud to be a part of this effort. We've had more than 2 billion pages uploaded in the 18 months since this launched. And this is a good option if you don't need transactions on the page. So a lot of people are using this as a best practice for a landing page. So both those examples were about page load time. But think about the whole customer journey. Think about them filling forms. Think about all the things that we ask customers to do to get to a result. And if you're like me, I'm a huge fan of form fill. So I delight when you type that first character and Chrome Autofill fills all the fields 
in the form because I don't want to type as much on my device. And so again at I.O. we went further than that and we launched a Google Payment API. So Chrome Autofill is for customers that you've already engaged with, who've filled those fields before or who you know. But the Google Payment API will let new customers autofill those fields as well as their payment information to defriction the onboarding and the experiences people go through to be able to become your customer. So some basics. The first thing is test your site. Second is fix the easy stuff. Like within a week, you could have massive improvements. And then to the extent that it's useful to you, come talk to us about how we do some of these more advanced things over the longer term. But if, again, if there's one thing you do, focus on the speed of your mobile site. The second thing that you need for assistive experiences is personalization. You need to have an experience that people feel is about them, not about clemency, but about Jason. And why? Because 63% of people who show up at your site want you to use their order history to customize their experience so that all of us in this room have a different experience. And I'll tell you a personal story about me is that I have a bus commute back in San Francisco. And a lot of times I'm on the bus coming home and I know that I don't have anything for dinner. And so I will admit that often I'm on the way home and I'm figuring out dinner and ordering dinner. But I don't order dinner from the best Indian restaurant in my neighborhood. And I don't order from the second best Indian restaurant in my neighborhood. I order from a restaurant that serves perfectly good Indian food that has a delightful and easy mobile UX. And so you think about that idea, the idea back to, to Geraldine is that better experiences drive preference. In this case, I'm choosing arguably an inferior product because of the UX. And so I would argue that the UX is becoming part of the product as consumers experience all of your brands. So how do you do this? One of the tools that we have that we help you with is Google Analytics. And the idea here is to understand your customers better. I'm going to give you two examples of how the tool lets you do that. The first is user ID. This allows you to take sample customers that you know and see their journey across devices, across sessions, in and out of app and web, and across all of that. And to understand their journey. And then to see where they get stuck. To the extent that they don't convert to whatever event you're driving toward, you can understand, oh, they got stuck at this particular page. Was it because of speed, because of form fill, because of something else? And you can dive in and be agile in your development as you dive in on that. In these particular verticals that are very journey-oriented, considered purchases, this tool has been invaluable. The second thing I want to talk about is custom visitor segments. This allows you to define a cohort of people based on things that you care about and then look at those journeys. So you can pick people who have watched a video on your site or who visited your site a couple of times in the last month or who have four things in their cart, apparently. <laughs> um, and you can build a cohort around them and then see their journey across devices, across sessions, and understand, again, how they move through your brand relationship and where you can improve that and how the improvements you make do or don't help those people navigate your brand. Two relatively easy things that you can do fairly quickly, and we've got a lot of support for you on this. I want to give the example of someone who's done an amazing job with personalization. That is the L'Oreal brand, Maybelline. Maybelline understood that there was sort of a macro trend in cosmetics that was coming, um, but that had some hurdles to get over, specifically the idea of contouring. And the idea of contouring is about using cosmetics to change the appearance of, uh, and shape of uh, uh, jawline and face, um, but that it's fairly hard to apply. Maybe some of the women in the audience will or will not confirm. Um, but the idea that it's fairly hard to apply contouring and understand how to do this, but the recognition that women were bringing their phones into the bathroom with them to understand how to do this. And so Maybelline got ahead of this. If you're going to take my picture, I need to... Thank you. It's hot in here. Um, Maybelline recognized the opportunity here and got ahead of this, and they did a couple of things. They created very personalized videos that they are based on demographics that allow you to see how to apply contouring for your specific skin tone and look and any number of different things. The second thing is they did is they built a campaign around intent, understanding people who are interested in content, sorry, in contouring, but who hadn't gotten over that hurdle of understanding how to do it. And so they're able to build this deeply personalized experience that addressed what that audience was looking for. It's been wildly successful. I presented the 9 million views six weeks ago, and I think that number is growing dramatically. And they are now the leader in this category and they sort of own the idea of contouring, all because of the insight and the ability to build for that personalization. This is some e-marketer uh, data and research around UK retailers and the types of things they're doing to drive personalization. 
And most of these will be familiar maneuvers for you. But the foundation of all of these is the data and the understanding. How do you bring together your CRM database with your web traversals and your, and your journeys in, in the web with what happens in your stores? And so the foundation for these actions, as well as the assistive future that we're building toward, is all about getting your data organized. And so the foundational sort of stage zero thing that you've got to do in this personalization section is be ready for that by having your data in a state and your consumer data in a state that you can use that. I think the takeaway from this is that don't think about personalization as something that your uh, marketing department, your IT department enables, but broadly, it's not a feature you put into one of your channels, one of your interfaces. But personalization needs to be a through thread and a strategy across everything that you do. It will only increase as technology gets better, as these experiences get better, as we get more assistive. The third thing that you need to do in an assistive world is make that journey continuous, regardless of what device and how the consumer engages you. It's the ultimate omni-channel consumer. And you have to be smart about passing them back and forth and allowing them to pick where she wants to engage and giving her the experience that she wants. The omni-channel is a growing part of your audience and they are dramatically more valuable. So you can build for the omni-channel customer now or you can wait and build for the omni-channel later. But you have to do this. Is the customer wants to engage you in and out of your stores physical world and digital world, across different devices, across an app and across the web. That customer wants to engage you when she wants to and where she wants to, and so you need to build for this. And when you do, it's dramatically more valuable. So I give the example of Domino's Pizza, a fairly traditional pizza brand and big part of my university experience, which traditionally was started based on the idea that you made a phone call and the pizza showed up within a certain amount of time. But Domino's has rebuilt itself as a digital company, a technology company that happens to deliver pizza. They understand this idea that the UX is the product. Domino's has, I, I'm going to get this number probably wrong, but they have like 13 or 14 digital ways that you can order from them. You can obviously order on a tablet, a desktop, and mobile, but you can text them an emoji. You can engage them on social media. I think there's a picture of a watch. There's not, but you can do it on a watch. They literally have every possible way that you can engage them digitally because they see where it's going. And they store all of that, and they do the personalization that I talked about, but they make it seamless as you move back and forth across these different devices. And that's had a huge impact for them. They now have full 50% of their orders in 2016 happen on digital, and half of those orders happening on a mobile device. Much easier, much more seamless as they move back and forth, and much more assistive. But that's just in the digital world. You also have to deal with people in the physical world, and many of you will have physical stores and have to think about how digital impacts stores as we stand in stores and find our way to stores using these devices. And to give the example of UK company River Island, a fashion retailer, that decided that they wanted to move their store windows beyond the physical store. And so working with us, they drew a radius around all of their stores and offered a digital experience to the consumer who was looking for their brands uh, and the products that they carry outside of the store to allow the consumer to have a localized website experience that let them see products that were in stock and how far it is to the store and how many minutes it would take them to get there. And the result of that is pretty astounding. And this is like a 1.0 effort for them, is a 17% increase in store visits among that cohort compared to a control group. Using digital to drive people into the physical storefront and thinking truly omni-channel in this way. So the takeaway here is that these digital devices are only going to grow there's going to be more and more of them. I think there's a picture of a VR one here. I'm not sure exactly how that plugs in. But the idea that your consumer is going to engage, as we said, as she wants to. And she's going to expect you to be assistive in those moments. And so if you think about that journey independent of the devices, and sometimes that's organizational, right? Sometimes we have our web team and our app team. Or we've got our physical store merchandisers and our digital team. And organizationally, that's holding us back. It's another thing you heard Geraldine mention. And so I think we, too often we show our org chart to the customer when we start showing them a different experience in the store and different merchandising than we do in digital. And so I want to come back to a couple of ideas. I want to come back to Geraldine's idea that better experiences drive preference. I want to come back to my Indian food experience and the idea that I'm not picking what is necessarily the best korma, but I'm picking whoever's got the best front end. Whoever makes that experience better for me is winning that moment. And the idea that UX actually is your product as much as the korma, although I'm guessing no one in this room is in the Indian food business. We gave you three things to go back to your teams. 
The first is to really do a speed audit and understand how you can help the consumer faster. The second is to invest in personalization. How can you make that experience about that particular consumer so that they can come back over and over and over again and know that you're going to serve them based on knowing them? And last, how can you be truly omni-channel and engage across all the devices that the consumer wants to engage in? The single biggest problem I see with all this is people see this as a marketing opportunity or a technology opportunity, but they don't necessarily see it as a business opportunity. And so I'm giving a fairly technical talk to a room full of executives because I think this is a business opportunity. I think it's something that every one of you in this room needs to take ownership of and to drive. And it's a place that we want to help. It's a place that we can bring data and we can bring best practices in category and out of category. But we need people to take ownership of the aperture through which everybody is engaging your brand. And again, that's about the digital connected device. So I want to say thank you very much for being here for the day. You're going to hear people come out here and do amazing things to remind you about speed. They're going to text and they're going to rap and there's going to be all kinds of different stuff going on in this stage to try to remind you about this point about speed. Um, the team has done an amazing job with both the venue and the day. Um, I appreciate your sitting in this sweltering room with me. <laughs> and thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Jason, for those riveting insights. I have to say that delight as an objective certainly sits well with me as a consumer. Thank you, too, for offering such practical and pragmatic tips. Now, a few of you have been submitting your questions for Jason via the event, so perhaps we could see some of those questions on the screen. Uh, if you're a startup or a small business, how do you manage to offer great service without having a large budget? So I'm going to interpret the question as meaning how do you offer great service through the mobile device. And I think that it doesn't need to be a large budget from a media spend perspective or from building a site. Like there are best practices that you can build and this is not a huge undertaking. And so what I would say is start with the basics, ask someone at Google in your category what is the best thing anyone's done and copy that. And that doesn't require an enormous amount of budget or insight just to get you to a baseline on all of the things that we talked about today. And then you can go a lot further with that, with an IT budget and a marketing budget and all that. But before you spend a dime, go audit and figure out what the best practice is in your category and, and humbly copy that. There you go. Uh, next question, if there's one thing I should do now to improve my mobile experience, one thing, what should that be? Is it too simple to repeat what I said? Um, <laughs> I, I, Again, I think what I would say on that is, is please go audit, and we can share the URL again, but please go audit your site speed. Please go take a look at how you load and the things you can do to improve that. I literally know of no other lever that's as big as that with the multiplier effect of how many people are going to gauge you on that mobile device. And it's actually fairly easy. For all the technologies we talk about and using cameras to do eye exams, come back and build a better, faster loading mobile website, uh, and I think you'll see the results that you're looking for. Take ownership of Speed. I'm taking that away with me. Thank you so much, Jason. Of course. Thank you.